Okay, good morning everyone and welcome to the 2016 Royal Tyrol Museum Speaker Series. Today, the Royal Tyrol Museum and its cooperating society are proud to present a tag team presentation by two of our very own, Mr. Benjamin Borkovic and Mr. Joe Sanchez. Joe and Ben are preparation technicians here at the Royal Tyrol Museum. Ben grew up in the Northwest Territories. He obtained his bachelor's degree in geology and biology at Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario, and subsequ subsequently pursued a master's degree in biological sciences at the University of Calgary. For his master's degree, Ben studied ceratopsians to determine if horned dinosaurs showed evidence of differences in horn size and shape between the sexes. After completing his master's degree, ben, uh, ben began working as a preparation technician here at the Royal Tyrol Museum. Joe grew up in Port Perry, Ontario. He obtained his bachelor's degree from the University of Toronto, majoring in both biology and paleontology. Subsequently, Joe moved to Ottawa to pursue his master's degree in paleontology at Carleton University. For his thesis, Joe studied early late Cretaceous fossil bird remains from Saskatchewan. While pursuing his studies, Joe worked at the Royal Tyrol Museum during the summers as a gallery interpreter, and upon completing his thesis, he was hired as a full-time preparation technician. For the past two years, Joe and Ben have, have been assigned to the Flood Mitigation Task Force, a program put, put together by the government of Alberta to investigate the impact of the 2013 Southern Alberta flood on historical resources, both archaeological and paleontological. In their talk today, Joe and Ben will present an overview of the discoveries they made while wading through the rivers of southern Alberta. <clears throat> Unfortunately, Joe and Ben have informed me that their presentation will not be performed as an interpretive dance, which will probably come as a disappointment to many of you, but it will instead be performed as a rockabilly musical, so that's even better. <laughs> so without further delay, I present you Mr. Benjamin Borkovic and Joe Sanchez. Thank you, Francois, for the introduction. Uh, for those of you who don't know us, my name is Joe Sanchez, and this is Ben Borkovic. And we're going to uh, be talking to you today about the Royal Trail Museum's flood mitigation project, uh, which started in June of 2014. Uh, just a quick overview of what we're going to be doing today. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the history of the 2013 flood, and then we'll go into what the flood mitigation project is, how it came about, and then uh, show you some cool places of where we worked, what we found, do a bit, and then do a bit of a conclusion. So without uh, further delay, uh, I'll give it to you, Ben. Thank you, Joe. So our story begins in June 2013, when an unusual pressure system resulted in warm, humid air being driven up from the southern states across Alberta and then pinned against the Rocky Mountains, where it dumped rain for several days straight. You can see that between the mornings of June 19th and June 22nd, some 200 millimeters of rain fell west of Calgary in the foothills, and in particular, over a foot of rain fell just upstream of High River. By that point in June, we'd already had a very wet season, and so the soil was already completely saturated and didn't take up any more of this precipitation. There was also a, due to the late cool spring that we were having, there was a persistent snowpack in the mountains, and when this rain fell on the snow, it liquidated pretty much overnight. So one of the first communities to be hit by the flooding was Canmore, and Cougar Creek flows out of the mountains and right through part of town, and normally is nothing more than a trickle. But when swollen with the rainwater and the melted snow, it was flowing very, very strongly already on June 19th when residents in the area went to bed, and when they were woken, from, uh, woken up that night a few hours later and told to evacuate, it was in full flood mode. This is the culvert just where it enters the main part of the residential area. You can see how high the water level is. On the other side of that bridge, the river basically exploded, uh, destroying its engineered banks and damaging properties all along the river's edge. At the bottom of the hill, it cut the Trans-Canada Highway in half, stopping traffic into and out of the Bow Valley for several days. One of the hardest, if not the hardest hit communities was the town of High River. When the Highwood River spilled its banks, it flooded huge amounts of the town, uh, damaging properties, homes, and vehicles. A rather impressive series of photos was captured when Kevin Yates' truck was trapped in the rising waters. He climbed through the back window with his cat Momo. They jumped into the river, uh, into the raging water there, and were luckily were able to swim to safety. To give you a different perspective on just how severe the flooding was and how quickly the waters rose, 
This is a chart showing Government of Alberta flow rate data for the Highwood town site for the Highwood River, or the High River town site for the Highwood. Usual flow rates through town are about 70 meters cubic, or 70 cubic meters per second for June. And on the day of June 20th, it jumped from there to 1,790 cubic meters. To put that a different way, it, there's 1,000 liters of water in one cubic meter. So it jumped from 70,000 liters flowing through any given point in town per second to 1.8 million. And that's before the gauge broke. A similar story unfolded in Bragg Creek when the Elbow River flooded, destroying numerous businesses and homes. Rather infamously, there's a video of a house being washed downstream and crushed against a bridge. Uh, the Red Deer River and its tributaries all flooded, like this bridge being washed out in Water Valley. And of course, we know all too well that a few days later, the Red Deer River flooded here in the Drumheller Valley as well. This is a photo from Sandbank and efforts to protect a property in East Cooley. In the southwestern part of the province, the Crow's Nest River flooded upstream of the Old Man Reservoir. This is Lundberg Falls Provincial Recreation Area. It's a really beautiful spot, and we camped there for several days while working in the area. And this is what it looked like in June of 2013. With all this flood water, sorry, with all this flood water rushing into the Old Man Reservoir, it was quickly filled to capacity. And although they opened the gates to regulate flow downstream, they had no option but to open all the floodgates at once, looking like this. So needless to say, the old man flooded along its entire length, destroying or impacting numerous communities where it meets with the bow to become the South Saskatchewan River. Uh, subsequent downstream communities like Medicine Howe were flooded as well. So the Elbow River was already flooding and the Bow River was already flooding. And unfortunately, they both meet in the middle of Calgary, resulting in widespread flooding in the downtown. Uh, famous sites like the Saddle Dome and the Stampede Grounds were flooded, as well as numerous residential areas and neighborhoods along both rivers, which led to mass evacuations from the city. So in the end, a few days of rain had a colossal impact on southern Alberta, one that will be felt for many years to come. The Bow River was flowing through Calgary at its peak at nearly 10 times its normal flow rate, and incredibly, the, High River, the Highwood River was going through the town of High River at 25 times its normal flow. About $6 billion in damage were done to infrastructure or property in southern Alberta, including nearly 1,000 kilometers of roads and highways that were closed for damage. About 100,000 people were evacuated or displaced by the floods, many of whom found they had no homes to return to, and five people lost their lives. Um, it gets a little bit less press, but the rivers themselves were impacted by the flooding as well, and huge uh, amounts of the river's banks or courses were reshaped uh, during the flood, and hundreds of tons of sediment were moved. So, now that we have a bit more of a background about the 2013 flood, I'm going to go into what exactly our, uh, the paleontology flood mitigation project was and how it came about. So, in the wake of the 2013 flood, we started to receive reports of fossil finds along these affected rivers, one of which was along the Old Man River uh, near Fort McLeod, where a couple came across a, uh, a boulder that had been obviously uh, been removed by the flood. Uh, with fossils in it. They reported this to the museum, and it ended up being a small dinosaur known as a leptoceratops. So this is uh, the specimen brought back to the museum. So what we're looking at right now is uh, just the right side of the hips. After further preparation done by one of our technicians, Donna, uh, the specimen's actually been turned over a bit here but you can see just how beautiful the specimen is. What we're looking at right here is the pectoral region, and this is the uh, left arm coming down. Something really neat about it is that the animal, his, his arms are like curled up underneath him. He's, it seemed to have died in like a sitting position or lying down. Um, and the specimen seems to be complete. Now with the finding of this, it occurred to people that with so much sediment being removed by these flooding events that there's a good chance that a lot of fossils were exposed um, from the 2013 flood. So the Royal Trail Museum, along with the government of Alberta, created the uh, flood, Paleontology Flood Mitigation Project, the purpose of which would be to find, identify, and protect these paleontological resources. And that is where Ben and I came in. Now, one of our first tasks were to figure out exactly where we could work. Um, Southern Alberta is full of rivers. There's lots of area to, uh, to work. And 
with just Ben and I working, there's no way that the two of us can prospect all those rivers in just a few years. So we had to prioritize uh, where we wanted to work. And to do that, we created some criteria. First of all, what rivers were affected by the floods. Um, second, which rivers do we know that have already fossil finds been found there? If we found fossils there before, there's a good chance we might find fossils there again. Third, if uh, we don't know fossils from those areas, do we at least know of a lot of exposed rock or outcrop of the right age there? There's no use of us to be walking up and down a river and there'd be no exposed rock because if there's no exposed rock, we're not gonna find the fossils. And finally, we interviewed some of the uh, technicians and curators here at the museum to get recommendations from them as well of areas that they thought were likely to find fossils. So once we did that, um, we started working. Let me go uh, quickly through uh, the rivers that we looked at, uh, starting north on the Red Deer River. We worked along two sections, one right in Red Deer and another just around uh, the Sundry area. We did work on Nose Creek in the north end of Calgary. We worked on a couple different sections of the Bow River, uh, one west of Calgary near Cochrane and another east of Calgary. Uh, something interesting about uh, with the Bow River that was different from us working on some of the other rivers is because of the size of the Bow River, uh, the width and the depth of it, there's no, it would take us forever walking along there and there's no way that we could wade across the river. So we both went out, got our boating license and uh, used the museum's boat, uh, which worked great. We were able to do, uh, prospect a lot of uh, rock in a short amount of time. Continuing, continuing on, uh, we worked on the Highwood River south of Calgary. And this is the same river that uh, flooded um, the town of High River. We worked on the Sheep River near the confluence uh, where it runs into the Highwood River. The Little Bow River, we worked from the uh, Traverse Reservoir down to where it empties out into the Old Man River. To work on the Willow Creek uh, between the towns of Claire's Home and uh, Granham. The Old Man River, we worked uh, three different sections of this. Uh, the furthest west, we were uh, near Highway 22. And then the one there in the middle is uh, near Fort McLeod where the Leptoceratops was found. And then finally, a uh, section near Monarch uh, west of Lethbridge. And we worked south of Lethbridge on the St. Mary River. And then west of the Old Man Reservoir, we worked on the Crow's Nest River. And then finally, uh, we did work on the Castle River in two different sections, one near Pincher Creek and another section near Beaver Mines. So working this large expanse of area, we were able to walk uh, across uh, many different types of rocks uh, through lots of different formations, um, which expanded a large period of time from the early Cretaceous in the Blair or the Blairmore group to past the age of the dinosaurs into the Paleogene in the Pascapoo, Willow Creek, or the Upper Willow Creek and Upper Scholard formations. So once we started working, some of the first things that we noticed were the flood impact on these rivers. A common site for us were tree wraps. Um, these are caused by uh, the debris that's in the floodwaters being pushed up against trees and the pressure from them is just starts wrapping all this debris around the trees. So this was a common site and here's a couple examples along the Bow River and we'd find tons of different things. You can ask us about later of all the weird things that we found in these. Um, but uh, found lots of different debris. Here's another example on the Old Man River. Some more um, examples of the flood impact. I don't know how easy it is to see, but this is a bridge um, that we worked near on the Little Red Deer River. And you can see there's logs jammed up in there. And those occurred from the floodwaters that were carrying the debris and they were high enough that they could just jam them right underneath the bridge. And this bridge is at least 12 feet high. So that just shows you how high the water was in this area. 
right here we have a high water mark. Um, so there's Ben. This is how high the water has got in this area. Uh, so what we're seeing here is this is just fallen till from above. That would have been all along here, but it's been washed, washed away from the uh, bottom half, showing just how high the water was. And then a very common sight that we saw everywhere was slumping along the rivers. And this is occurring when the rivers are undercutting parts of the outcrop and the, the rock falls down. Something interesting to point out in this picture is right here is a washed up uh, trailer hitch, um, probably from the flood. So now Ben will talk about some of the sights and sounds. So working in and along these rivers, we found a total of about 144 paleontological sites. We also found one marmot. Um, but yeah, those paleontological sites are spread over an area extending from Red Deer in the north down to within a few dozen kilometers of the US border. The northern part of our field area was centered around the Red Deer River Basin. And you can see the localities we, just, we've, we found or worked with marked in here by these push pins. Sort of in the middle of our field area was focused around the Bow River subbasin, and then uh, just happened to be in around Calgary. As Joe mentioned, we had a lot of success near Cochrane, and we found a ton of sites in the Paleocene rocks along the Highwood and Sheep Rivers down here, just south of Calgary. The southern part of our field area extended from the Rocky Mountains in the west over towards uh, near the town of Picture Butte, and we found fossils kind of across this whole range working on a ton of tributaries and rivers that all contributed to the Old Man River Basin. And this is one of the most productive areas. So from those fossil sites, uh, we're going to take some time now for the next section of this talk to talk about the actual things we found at those localities and just highlight some of the more exciting or more interesting areas we worked or specimens that we found. The first one is one that we call the Highwood Turtle Block. So this big slab of sandstone fell down from the riverbank when the Highwood flooded and collapsed its riverbanks. Um, and this thing is loaded with turtle bones, such as this mandible or lower jaw. You can see here, you're looking at the underside of it, but the bone's in quite a nice shape. And this here is a turtle skull looking at the top. Probably doesn't look like very much, but that's actually a good thing. So what you're seeing here is the long process off the back end of the skull, and that suggests that the bone's probably in very good shape and just below that surface. So it'll be a nice one once it's prepared. This site's particularly interesting because it's quite close in time after the extinction of the dinosaurs. And so the more we can find out about the animals that either survived through the boundary or through the extinction or that moved into the area shortly thereafter, the more we can understand kind of how these ecosystems rebounded. So when we first found this block, it was separated well enough away from the riverbank that we could walk completely around it and we could work on it on all sides. But when we returned there this spring with Dr. Brinkman, we realized that the river had brought down more of the, the banks on top of it, and it was partially buried by the slumping, and even some of the bones on the surface were being damaged. So rather than risk losing it to the river, we decided we wanted to come back right away and do what we could to collect some of the specimens. So we returned there with Mark and some equipment, and using the rock saw, we were able to make cuts in the really, really hard sandstone, and that allowed us to protect the bones in plaster, chisel them out of the rock, and bring them back to the museum. So some of the bone has been prepared or started to be prepared. You can see this is an example of two different mandibles from the block, and we're excited to get the main skull piece started soon. A little further down the high wood and lower in section, so even closer to the boundary, we came across uh, this sandstone layer. And on the surface between the two backpacks is an area about 20 square meters in which we found over 100 small animal bones. This includes everything from mammals to fish uh, turtles, champs of sore, which are sort of small crocodile-like reptiles, and crocodiles themselves. So this is an example of one of the bones that we found in there. This is the jaw of a small mammal known as a condylarth. This is the lower edge here. The tooth row would be along here, and you can see there were still two molars in place. And then this process is what would connect the lower jaw to the rest of the skull. So we were able to quarry this out of the bone bed there and bring it back to the museum so it could be prepared and studied. You can get a sense for just how high the density of the bones is in there. As you can see all these um, assorted bones jumbled together. It's very similar in a way to the, some of the dinosaur bone beds that we find in Dinosaur Provincial Park, except it's just tiny. And it's a very unusual, a very unusual sort of way to find uh, small mammal sites or small vertebrate sites like that. 
So the one thing with this site is that it's very close to the water's edge, <coughs> and we're quite sure that during the flood it was completely submerged. Um, the top layer of it in particular was, was quite loose. And so in order to avoid risk, uh, the risking uh, losing some of the information at the site or losing some of the fossils from this site, we collected what we could by coring um, some of the fossils out of the surface. And then we also collected several, sorry, several bags of matrix by cleaning up the upper layer. And we brought those back to the museum so that it could be screen washed and sorted and looked at under the microscope. And by doing that, we found many more small fossils, small vertebrate fossils, such as fish scales, crocodile teeth, and small mammal teeth, like this condylarth molar here. So the next group of fossils that we're, I'm going to talk about are some of the tracks or trackways that we found along the St. Mary River uh, south of Lethbridge. So this first one here is an example of just a single track. Uh, this is a hadrosaur footprint. I'm having a hard time making it out. There's one toe right here. Here's the middle toe. Here's the third toe. Uh, something I thought was pretty neat is it kind of has, you can see the pad of the, the footprint right there. It almost looks like a, a dog footprint. Now, it being so close to the river, you can see the water right here. We were afraid that it would most likely be lost to any further uh, flooding events. You can see the rock has all been starting to erode around it as well. So we decided to quarry this out. We loaded it up onto a frame pack, and then we took turns carrying it back several kilometers back to our vehicle. And uh, our backs were quite sore at the end of that day. So we also found several trackways, and these are a series of tracks all together. So in the first season, uh, we found this trackway uh, on a one by two meter uh, block, and it contains uh, over a dozen small theropod tracks. It might be a little bit hard to see from the picture, but I'll circle a couple of them. So you can see, this is the middle toe right here, and you can see a bit of a claw mark, the outer toe, another outer toe, and that's a very, another similar footprint. There's another one right here in the middle. Now, the interesting thing about this one is that it's different from most of the other tracks that are in here. So that also tells us that there was at least two different types of animals that, were, that walked across this, uh, this plain at one time. It was the first trackway that we found. When we came back this uh, field season to uh, do some more work on that trackway, we came across another much larger trackway. Uh, this is about three meters by one and a half meters. And this, this block was just full, full of tracks and of all different sizes. It's really neat. We'll give you some zoomed up pictures to, to take a look at them. Might be a little bit difficult to see. I'll point them out. But these are what we call it kind of like the medium to small size theropod, maybe an ornithomimid that created these. So there's one track here. There's the middle toe, outer toe, outer toe. And it's going in that direction. And there's another track right here going in the opposite direction. And there is well over a dozen of these on the block. Right here, they're kind of marked out in chalk. It's a little bit harder to see, so we outlined them in red here. But there's two much larger prints. This one here probably belongs to a tyrannosaurid. And the other one there could as uh, po a possible hydrosaur footprint. And there was about three of these larger tracks on the block. And then we had lots and lots of these little tiny ones. If you can't make it out, this is one toe here. There's the middle toe. There's another toe there. And there was well over a dozen of these tracks on the block. So, and these are either from a very small theropod or possibly even a bird track. So if we zoom back out, these are those first two tracks that I pointed out. Here's another one of those kind of medium-sized tracks. There's that large tyrannosaur track, some small tracks, and then there's just tracks all over the block. We counted at least 40 tracks on this block, um, and there's probably more that we haven't even seen yet. It all depends on how the light hits it, because we came there one part of the day, and we could see certain tracks, and then we came at a different time of day, and all of a sudden there's other tracks that we never saw before on there. And again, just something to notice is just how close it is to the river. On the same day, we came across this trackway. Um, just so that you know, all three of these trackways are within about 200 meters of each other. 
So Don Henderson here is pointing out the first track in a series of about five tracks, which I'll point out right here, which are probably created by a large ornithomimid. And then we had another couple tracks that uh, went across them. I know from the picture it might be hard to see, but take my word for it, there are tracks there. Now, dealing with um, how close to the river these rocks are, we wanted to uh, make sure that we were able to collect or preserve, preserve these tracks because although the blocks are so large, it's probably unlikely that the rivers are gonna carry them away. But over time, uh, further flooding events will erode away the tracks and then we lose all record of them. But because of the size, there's no way that we could actually bring back these large trackways back to the museum without a lot of difficulty. So what we decided to do is on further return, we made latex molds of them. And this way we could make a detailed copy of, of the trackways, bring back the mold, and then do a cast uh, replica back here at the museum. Something interesting about this third block is actually when we came back to make the mold of it, we noticed that there was another series of tracks on the bottom of, a, again, another large ornithomimid that were walking parallel to the original tracks. So once we got back to the museum, uh, just recently, actually in the past couple of weeks, we have started to uh, cast these trackways. And we're I'm glad to say that we're finished two of the three right now. And we'll probably start the third one uh, next week. Um, Something interesting that we did though with the second trackway is that we made a time lapse of us working on it. So what we're doing right here is we are applying um, some layers of resin. So the resin layers are the detailed layers to really capture all the details of the footprint. And then once we're done uh, applying all this resin, what we're doing now is we're adding plaster and fiberglass and this will help strengthen the back of the, of the cast, uh, making it more rigid. And then once we get those on, we add some supports to add even more um, rigidity and strength to the back of the specimen. And then once all the supports are, are on, we add more fiberglass and plaster to really hold those in. And we work away. Now once the, uh, all that is dried, uh, dealing with the plaster, there's a lot of rough edges. So we had to take some time to uh, sand out a lot of the rough edges. But once all that was done, then we were able to move it out and then slowly peel away the latex to reveal the tracks. And there we have the finished product. And so now it's ready for uh, scientific research and then, I don't know, maybe one day even display out in the galleries. So the next um, site that I want to talk about is the Castle River Hadrosaur. Uh, I do want to mention that Ben and I did not find this specimen. This one was found by a fisherman, uh, I believe his name was Evan Kappen, and his sons while they were fishing out on the Castle River. He had the eldest son actually uh, found the boulder in the middle of the river and he thought he saw some fossils on it. And so they took some pictures, they called the museum, uh, we sent a crew out there to take a look at it and lo and behold, we had a dinosaur or a hadrosaur. So what we're looking at there is the skull of this animal. So the, I don't know how easy it is to see, but these are the, the tooth rows right here. So this would be the, the tip of the snout the back of the skull, and then up top there, we're starting to get the uh, neck vertebra. Now, it was very likely that this, uh, this boulder has been brought there by flooding events, um, and it's been heav heavily weathered. And so we decided that because of where it is that we needed to collect it, especially we don't know very much about dinosaurs in this area, so we thought it was a very important specimen to collect. Now, because of the size of it though, there is no way that we could just, I wish we could just throw it on a flame pack, but that would break our backs. So uh, we needed a helicopter to lift this one out. So five of us working together with uh, uh, pry bars, we were able to roll it over into the helicopter net. Then the helicopter came and picked it up and has brought it back to the museum where you can see it today at the, in our fossils and focus gallery 
our fo fossils and focus exhibit in the galleries. And if you haven't seen it yet, I, uh, I highly suggest you do so. All right. <coughs> So one of the uh, largest and most exciting specimens that we found, and one that kept us busy through most of this fall, is one that we call the Callum Creek Ceratopsian. So this is the southwestern part of the province. We're at the southern end of the Waldron Grazing Reserve, which is just a beautiful area of short grass prairie tucked in amongst the foothills. And it's a gorgeous place to work, which is a good thing, uh, because as Joe and I were making our way up this tributary of the old man, as we passed this sandstone ledge here that you can see arcing down, in amongst the rocks of this uh, cobble bar here, we found some dinosaur bone. Joe's holding this piece here, and the bone is black, similar to that leptoceratops, and similar to the bone of Black Beauty, the T-Rex out on display in the galleries. So we were pretty excited to find this, and we spent the afternoon digging through the cobble bar to see if we could find some more, and you can see Joe excavating that piece right there. And sure enough, by the end of the day, we had quite the little collection of pieces. Um, we could tell right away that all of these went together and that they all came from a single set of jaws from one large dinosaur. So as we looked a little further in the area, we noticed that there was still bone in situ as well in the riverbank above it. The bone's dark here. You can see it's kind of covered in sand, but it's, it's dark there against the tan of the sandstone. So we actually found bone in three little spots, just above the hammer to the right in the shadow, and then just sort of to the right of that bump. So we weren't really sure what we were dealing with yet, but we knew that there was something still in the hillside, and we also knew that it was being washed out and carried downstream in the river, or in the creek. So over the winter, a bit of prep work was done on that piece Joe was holding, and you can see it's got a very nice shape here. So this is actually the predentary, or the lower beak, of a horned dinosaur, something like Triceratops, and it was a, turned out to be quite a large one as well. So we were really interested to go back to see what else we could find. When we returned in the spring, or in the summer, we were disappointed to find that, or dismayed, I guess, to find that uh, more slumping had occurred, and the meltwater and the creek had sort of combined to wash more sediment over the site. Before we left in the winter, we'd collected all the pieces that we could that were loose, and we'd even shored up the bone with glue and buried some of it to try and help it get through the winter. But we found a lot of it had been washed out and was at risk of being washed away. So we picked up what we could, and we knew we wanted to try to do something with whatever was here. During the same visit, though, we found some bone that we hadn't noticed before. And just tucked in here was a piece of horn once we cleared the rock away from it. So looking at what we'd found, we realized we had well, something up here from the jaws. <coughs> the epijugal, which is sort of from the cheek-like area on, on a horn dinosaur, base of the frill, and a horn. So it was possible that we were dealing with something a little bit larger than we'd initially thought, although we weren't sure what it was. But we knew that we, it was at risk from the river by being there. It was going to continuously be eroded over the next few seasons and that we wanted to go back. So in September this year, we returned to the site and set up camp. It was just a beautiful area tucked in. You can see the mountains in the background. <clears throat> beautiful sunrises that lit up the sky, turned the Rockies pink, and it was close to the site. So every morning we'd walk over there and get to work. So the first thing that we needed to do was clear the overlying rock away from the bone layer we did that using jackhammers and shovels and pickaxes. So this is sort of the site that looked like while we were working. You can see the quarry over here as we were working to get through this rock layer and down here to the bone layer. Before the end of the first week, we were pretty excited to find the right horn. Up until this point, everything we'd seen was only from the left side of the skull, so we weren't really sure how much was there. <clears throat> but when we found the right horn, we knew that this could be a lot more complete than we had kind of dared to hope. And Caleb is pointing at the bases and cross-section of both, both horns there. So we started to get an idea for what the width of the skull may be. So we got back to work, and we continued to try to lower the rock around where the skull was and to isolate it in the, in the quarry. So quickly we ended up finding something that was very similar to the snout or the part of the beak at the front. So we knew where the front of the animal was, and we had an idea for how wide it was. And then one afternoon, we were lucky here when we hit this piece of bone, it's only about 10 centimeters long, but it's highly recognizable and diagnostic because it included the bone suture between uh, two particular bones that make up the back left corner of a horned dinosaur's frill. <clears throat> so all of a sudden we knew where the skull started, we knew where it ended, and we knew roughly how wide it was. We had a good sense finally of, of how big this animal would be. So we got back to work and we kept moving rock away from around it. This probably doesn't look like much, but it was starting to take shape from the back. This is sort of the quarry where we were working. And if I 
doodle with crayons here. This will give you a sense of sort of what we're looking at. This is the back of the frill, not a smiley face. Uh, this is the back of the frill here, swinging around this way in sort of this mushroom cap shape. And we had both horns, the left and the right, here. Unfortunately, they're both cut in half where they were exposed from this, through the sandstone. There was a really neat moment when we were working along the right side of the skull and Darren moved a piece of rock from right here. And all of a sudden, it kind of went from just being a big pile of rocks to actually looking like a dinosaur. So this is the right side of the frill from Emily's legs down past Darren's knee, in through this notch. This is the jugal here, and then along the right part of the tooth row on the upper jaw. And so suddenly we kind of knew what the, what the skull looked like. From the side, this is basically what we were dealing with, although the horns weren't quite as sticking out like that, but this is just a general sense of the way the skull was lying in the layer and the way it was relative to the quarry. <clears throat> so this is very different than digging for dinosaurs in Dinosaur Park or here in the Drumheller Valley because the sandstone is very, very hard. So we had to work with natural cracks that were already there in the sandstone and slowly take this thing apart, uh, kind of like a giant puzzle in reverse. So what we were doing, just to show you the process, was we would label everything and document carefully as we removed it. So block 20, we made some marks so we knew how everything goes back together. When we lift it up, you can just see a little bit of dark bone under there. And here, that's the nasal horn sticking through. And then everything was labeled and wrapped carefully and brought back to the museum so that we can actually put it back together the right way. For larger pieces, what we would do is wrap them in plaster, label everything carefully, sort of up direction, back front, and, and give everything a number and a label. And then we would flip these off as we could, slowly removing it piece by piece. You can see the bones exposed there. So what we would do then is cap it with plaster and prepare it for its trip back to the museum. So in this way, we slowly took the whole skull apart and accumulated quite the pile of little plaster jackets. As October wore on, we managed to isolate sort of the main bulk of the skull. We had a really great crew that we were working with and uh, with snow kind of looming in the mountains behind us, everyone was working very hard to make sure we could get this done before winter arrived. So we finally got it down to the last three major jackets, the biggest of which weighed in about 1,800 pounds, which was too heavy for even Joe to carry out. So again, we hired a helicopter, and in three quick sling loads, they were able to get all of the skull out from the creek and, and put safely on the back of a truck, and we brought it back here to the museum. And we're excited, to, or happy to say that Preparation has already started, and here you can see Ian working to expose the left side of the very tip of the snout on this dinosaur, the piece that would match up against the, the beak that we found. So hopefully it will be um, ready for study, and then maybe it'll be put on display, and hopefully you guys can see it someday as well. So now that we've gone through some of the more scientifically, or some of the more spectacular finds, I want to talk about maybe some of the smaller things not, that are not any less scientifically important or this porcupine, which we almost fell upon, um, but spotted just at the last second. So this is one of the, one of the earlier finds. We found a, a chunk of, of rock uh, with a partial turtle skull in it. I know it doesn't seem much to look at, um, but once it was prepped out, um, although it still doesn't look much to look at, um, Believe me, you know, the right person looking at it, uh, like Dom Brinkman here, could tell us a lot, and it really adds to a lot of the scientific information. Here we have Ben standing at the, on the Red Deer River, and he's just in front of a shell layer, or a shell hash layer, that we had discovered. And we found lots and lots of layers like this all through the different rivers that we worked on. Now these layers can be quite important because often in them we do find microvertebrate material or small bits of broken up pieces of animals like fish, mammals, um, turtles, amphibians, and other reptiles. Um, and although they don't give us one cool specimen, all the little bits and pieces together can show us the, whole, the greater picture of the area. And we found lots of different types of these shell hashes. There's one at uh, the top, I guess, your left from Sheep uh, River, and the other two are from the, the Highwood River. This is another example of one of those sites. It's called Nature's Hideaway. Now, myself and Ben, we did not discover this site. It was a previously known site, 
but that was also, previously known sites also fell under our jurisdiction because we wanted to see how the, flood in, how the floods impacted previous sites. Um, when we checked it out, we did notice, um, I think that it extended uh, further than previously known. So this past fall, myself, Dr. Craig, Scott, and Ben uh, went back there to collect more material. So here's a picture of uh, Dr. Scott and myself crossing the Highwood River. I just want you to notice at the bottom here, that's ice. There were several ice sheets that definitely floated across the river while we were trying to cross it. And I'm pretty sure at the end of the day, Ben could not feel his toes. So once we crossed the river, we collected 30, 50 pound bags of matrix, and then we hauled it back across the river to our vehicle. And these are now at the museum being screen washed, and then will later be, later be sorted and picked through so that we can find, uh, pick through for micro, micro material so that we get, again, get a, a nice bigger picture of the, of the animals that were living in this area at that time. Now, not everything that we found was vertebrate material. We did find a lot of shells. This is an example. Uh, we have Ben here for scale of a, just this is a wall of mollusk shells, a uh, possible oyster bed that we found on the Old Man River. And we found several examples of these on the Old Man River. Here's Ben um, on another, sitting in another shell bed. Uh, this one was really neat just because of all the tectonic activity here. It's all folded. If you can't see exactly, so this is the shell layer. It comes up, Ben's sitting in the apex. It kind of comes around, bends up, and folds back over again. Another reason why I really like this picture is it because it kind of looks like Ben is preparing himself for the next flood that's going to come in. You know, we give him a, uh, give him a paddle, add a captain's hat, <laughs> and, and, he's, and he's ready to go. Some other, uh, other neat sites that we found, we found lots and lots of plant sites. Now, um, I'm not very good with plants, so I couldn't really tell you too much about these, but uh, we found lots of them. And uh, these two here on your left are from the Highwood River. The one on the top right uh, is a plant site that we found on the Red Deer River. And the one on the bottom, uh, bottom right there is a plant site from the Bow River. And again, these all very scientifically important will add to the, add to the story of what was going on at that time. So to break down the numbers a little bit, now that you've seen a lot of the sites that we've done, um, we've prospected about 16 kilometers of river uh, using the boat, and that was all on the bow. And then we've done about another 157 kilometers of prospecting on foot um, across all the other rivers. Uh, that number is probably a low ball because it doesn't take into account if there was rock on both sides of the river that we had to walk across. And then if you want to just talk about walking, it doesn't take into account us walking back and forth, back and forth, and back and forth to multi sites multiple times. So we did quite a bit of walking. And with all that, we found 144 paleontological sites. And from those sites, we were able to mitigate and collect 63 different groups of specimens, which we brought back here to the museum and are now uh, cataloged and accessioned. Uh, just in case you don't know what this picture is, uh, we were on the Willow Creek uh, on a farmer's land. Um, and the farmer uh, mentioned to us that about two weeks earlier, he had seen a mama bear and her cub on the, on the land. But he hadn't seen anything for a while, so we should be good. Um, about 10 minutes walking on the river, we came across these tracks, very, very fresh tracks, and we did not spend very much more time on that section of the river. To give you uh, a little bit more of an overview of all the different things, because I know with the pa paleontology, a lot of people think of dinosaurs, but we found a lot of other stuff, lots of dinosaur sites, or plant sites, shell sites, trackways, mammals, fish, Turtles, crocodiles, champsosaurs, other bits of assorted bone that were so broken up that we couldn't tell what they were, but we knew they were fossils. Uh, some things that not even on there are like burrows, burrows as well. So lots of different things that all kind of come together to add um, onto the story of what was happening at that time. 
And that's it for all those of you who are wondering what Ben and I have been up to these last two years. That's what we've been doing. Um, but we haven't gotten here on our own. We've had a lot of help and, um, with, from people who've helped us either with collections, um, collecting the specimens, or when we bring back the specimens, booking hotels for us, uh, the landowners letting us on their land. If they don't let us on their land, we can't find anything. Um, and we just want to say thank you. Questions? <laughs>